Now, as I alluded to, we're, we're going to be wrapping up today a series entitled Making Change. And in this series, what we've been trying to do is just assess, you know, what it is that God would have to say to us about this very important, often conversation-dominating topic that has to do with our finances. In Proverbs, there is a verse that I think is very important for us to be aware of. It says this, fools spend whatever they get. <laughs> and I don't think anybody would disagree with that. What's interesting, though, is that this verse is actually connected to one of my favorite children's books that we have read our kids thousands of times, literally, in our home. And you might even know what this book is. I'm going to read a line to you from the book, and you tell me if you know what it is. In the great green room, there is a telephone and a red balloon and a picture of a cow jumping over the moon. And what book is that from? Good Night Moon. Good Night Moon. It's a classic. It's been around for almost 70 years now. It was written by a woman named Margaret Wise Brown. The story of the Good Night Moon is a story of only about 130 words. It even utilizes some poetic devices within it. It's, of a, it's a story of a rabbit that says good night to its room and all of the different things that are in the room, and even the moon that is just outside of the room, outside of the window. There was a point in time where I could literally recite that book to you without even reading the pages. I read it so many times. Now, the story with Goodnight Moon is one in which, as I read that book literally hundreds of times to my kids, I thought, this book's been around a long time. I bet there's a story to this book. And I came to find out there was actually a very intriguing story to this book. So Mar Margaret Wise Brown unfortunately died at a very young age or at a younger age of 42 years old and she never realized the success of her publications. She was only receiving minor royalties from this particular book and with that it was actually about to go out of publication. And so as she was as she was towards the end of her life unfortunately due to complications with surgery, she actually put a will together. And in that will, she designated the royalties of Goodnight Moon to go to a young boy named Arthur Clark. And Arthur Clark, was on, Arthur Clark was only eight years old at the time of Margaret's death. But he was a rather troubled child. He was a troubled that seemed to find, he was always a child that seemed to find himself in trouble. Couldn't ever quite uh, get along with other kids at school. Always seemed to be in trouble with his parents. And Margaret had a real heart for Arthur and decided to, again, give him the royalties of this book. Well, nobody knew how successful the book would actually be at that particular time. But Arthur, by the end of his life, would actually have received almost $6 million as a result of Good Night Moon and the royalties. But the unfortunate part of Arthur is this in his life, is that he never really got his life together. That the habits that he had at eight, he had at 18 and 28 and 38 and 48 and so on. He found himself often in trouble with law. He had a few kids by a few different women. And the kids, some of the kids actually lived with him. And he never quite understood how to manage this blessing that he had received through the royalties of the book. In fact, a 2000 article in Wall Street Journal tells the story of Arthur. And in that story, what they tell is that in, in five years, his family, with the two kids, had lived in seven different homes. They never washed clothes. They would wear them two or three times and then throw them away. All of the possessions that they owned were found in a black trash bag. And his most important possession was his driver's license, his birth certificate, and then a copy of Margaret's will that said he received the royalties of that book that was written so many years ago. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that story, I'm thinking, how foolish of Arthur, how ignorant of him. He had this huge blessing given to him. All of these riches were given to him, but he just never seemed to be able to get his act together. He was never able to do anything with it. He couldn't make the most out of what it was that had been given to him. It was really rather unfortunate. But from a national standpoint, probably, and certainly from a world standpoint, the thing that we all have to catch is every single one of us is in the same shoes as Arthur Clark. We have been blessed beyond our wildest imaginations with riches. The world annually, on average, lives on $3,000. 
The median income in America is 70. In our particular area of the country, it's even more than that. And guess what? We didn't do anything to earn it. We were just born into this world, and we happen to be born into this time, and we happen to be born into this particular country, in this place, and we have been blessed beyond our wildest imaginations as a result of that. And so the question then becomes all of, for all of us is, what are we going to do with what it is that we have been given? In the case of Arthur, unfortunately, he wasted it. But how is it that you and I and all of us make the best out of what it is that we have been given? How do we make the most out of what it is that we have been given? And we have been given a whole, whole lot. There's a story of Bill Gates when he was traveling around the world, specifically Africa, and he was establishing the Gates Foundation. And as he went through Africa, these rural areas of Africa, and seeing the challenges that they were dealing with, he came into one particular village, and the villagers knew that the group that was there was from America, but they didn't know who Bill Gates was. And so on one occasion, Bill Gates stopped at a particular uh, home, and he talked to a woman that lived there for five or ten minutes, and then he walked off. And then a man from that group went up to the woman and said, do you realize that you were just speaking with the richest man in the world? And the woman just sort of shrugged it off and said, well, everyone in America is rich. And we really are. And we are just like Arthur Clark. Now, you may not be mismanaging millions and millions of dollars, but in relation to the entire world, you have been given a lot. And so we have to ask the question, How do we make the most out of what we have been given? Now, you might not consider yourself rich, and you may not consider yourself somebody who has a lot of extra or a lot of spare money. I know I don't. We dealt with that last week, why we feel that way. But this week is how do we handle what it is that we have been given? How do we manage what it is that we have been given? And I'm just going to give you two simple principles, ideas, for you to consider and hopefully do something with things that I need to do something with. And the first one is this. It's pretty simple. We need to know where our money is going. Know where your money is going. And I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but I want us to say that together, okay? I want us to say this. I need to be, I'm going to say, this is what we need to say. I need to be knowing where my money is going. That's simple. Knowing where my money is going. On the count of three, and we're going to say, I need to be knowing where my money is going. Because I know you, and I know me, and we don't always know where our money is going. We can know if we want to, but we don't always know. So on the count of three, we want to say this together. Really reinforce this idea. I need to be knowing where my money is going. So on the count of three, let's say it all together. One, two, three. I need to be knowing where my money is going. Nobody disagrees with that. And we are all better at managing what we have been given if we are knowing where our money is going. Again, going back to Proverbs, the Bible says this, know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds. Now, you don't have a flock, well, you might, but I doubt you have a herd, or you might, but that was very different, and it's very different in our day than it was in that day. In this day, the livestock was your livelihood. This is how you provided for your family. It was the currency of this day because it was a barter society. And so as this is being written, the people would have understood, yes, I get it, one or two sheep for one or two goats. That's how it worked in this particular day. And you can have, even in this time, enough extra, enough spare, that you might even have a tendency to not know how much you really had to not really know how much was out there and how well it was uh, and what kind of condition it was in. And so what the writer of Proverbs is saying to each and every one of us is that we need to know the condition of our bank accounts. We need to know where our credit card balance is, what our credit card balance is. We need to be knowing, again, where our money is going. God has set each and every one of us up with something to manage. And to be clear, we again are all managers. From an eternal standpoint, nobody owns anything. And like any good money manager, you're managing something that somebody else owns and they're giving you to manage for a period of time. Now, I don't know how your money manager is, but I'll tell you this. If I were to go to my money manager and he wasn't really sure 
what was going on with my finances, like if he said something along the lines of, I think my plan will work. If I go to my financial advisor and he says, it seems as though you'll have enough money when you retire, this approach is probably right. If my financial advisor said something like that, then I'm gonna get a new financial advisor. Because I'm literally paying this guy to manage the money that he has been given by me. And it, my point is, is that's what God has done with each and every one of us. That he's given us this period of time to manage, this period of our life to manage what we have been given. And then at some point we have to give it on to somebody else and then it's their responsibility to manage. And again and again in parables in the New Testament, Jesus teaches us that there's going to come a point in time in which God is going to hold us accountable for how we are managing what it is that we've been given. In Mark chapter 13, there's sort of an example like this. This is what it says there. Be on guard. And this is talking about Jesus' second coming. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge. And each with their assigned task and tells the one at the door, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch, watch out, keep on, keep on guard, be alert. The idea isn't that you shouldn't sleep, that's silly. Obviously, when Jesus returns one day, there are going to be people who are sleeping, the idea is that you shouldn't be sleeping on where your money is going. You shouldn't be sleeping on your religious response, your spiritual responsibilities, the responsibilities of your faith. Don't sleep on telling other people about Jesus. Don't sleep on being a part of a faith community. Don't sleep on growing in your faith. Don't sleep on loving others. Don't sleep on doing those things, even managing your finances. Don't sleep on it because one day he's going to show up and you really don't, I don't know when that's exactly going to happen. And so here is the concern for each and every one of us is that we often settle for just knowing we can know, but never actually knowing. And you see, I know what you would say because I would say the same thing. Well, that's great, Phil, but I, I get this statement every month. I, that's great, Phil, but I got this app on my phone. That's great, Phil. I can go and look at my bank account if I'm really worried about it. I know that you can know because I know that I can know, but here's the catch. I don't always actually really know. And so what I want to encourage you with or challenge you with, just very simply, out of this simple point, is to, for the next week, maybe even two weeks, to really pay attention to where your money is going. Like, really pay attention to where your money is going. What are you spending your money on? And we've even provided you a few resources that are available out in the lobby. And they've got, all got QR codes. And you can look at these particular resources, and you can scan the QR code, and it, it can talk to you about a snowball calculator for a debt reduction snowball calculator, a custom money, money uh, plan. A, you can download an every dollar app, a 14 day money finder and then there's also a great there's a great um, resource out there to help you teach your kids how to manage money and they talk about the jar method and then there's again even opportunities to sign up as a generosity trailblazer we are providing these very free resources for you so you can know where your money is going i want you to be a good manager of what it is that you've been given i know i want to be a good manager of what i've been given and we're making these resources available for you to do just that because there's a tendency of ours to think that everything is okay. Like whenever we imagine our life and our finances, we see a, a graph similar to this because you can't talk about money and not show a graph. So here you go. You have an X axis, you have a Y axis. And when we look at this graph, we see that our income through the years is always a little up and down, up and down, up and down, especially if you consider inflation and things along those lines. But it's always going to outpace spending. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't quite work out that way for a lot of people. And the graph really looks a little bit more like this. And you have a few years here and there where the income does outpace the spending, but there's a lot of years where it doesn't. And you can handle that for a year or two, but you can't handle that for a decade or two. And I can't either. And so as we assess this, we got to say, All right, I need to know where my money's going because even though I'm making more money, Often that means that we are spending more money. And study after study has shown that 
people think that if they just make a little more, they just make a little more, then everything's going to be okay. But it doesn't work out like that. In fact, as Biggie Smalls once said, more money, more problems. <laughs> and, that's, and that is so true. More money we have, more problems we get. And you know what else? It's a whole lot easier to replace a job where you make $55,000 a year. But try replacing a job where you make $150,000 a year, $200,000, $250,000 a year. Those jobs don't grow on trees. And that's why often, the more we make, there's often more stress associated with it. And we have to be very, very mindful to know where our money is going. Now, one caution with all this. Let's just say you take me up on the challenge. This week, you're really going to hone in on where money is being spent. Remember, you're still a Christian. So that means when you see that your husband has been ordering more DoorDash than you knew about, <laughs> and you see that your wife has been ordering a few too many lattes at Starbucks, you are going to love one another as Jesus loved you. And it is very important to remember this core principle because, and, and directive because it's not going to do you any good to be harsh with one another. That's not going to solve the problem. What's going to solve the problem is figuring out where your money's actually going, taking a little bit of time to talk through this. Okay, why did you have to order the Venti Karma Macchiato with all these other additives and it was a $7 drink? Why did you have to do that? Let's talk through that. Maybe there's a better option, a cheaper option, or maybe we can just make it at home. Who knows? Lots of options out there. But number one thing that we got to catch from all of this, if we're going to be a good manager of the riches that we have been given, and we have been given so much, just like Arthur Clark, so much. We gotta know where it's going. We gotta know where it's going. The second thing after we know where it's going is this. Biblically speaking, we have to get our priorities right. Biblically speaking, we have to get the priorities in line. We have to look and say, okay, God, where, where is it exactly that you need to speak into my life in this particular area of my particular life. There are five things that we do with our money. This is what, and we, this gets categorized a few different ways, but this is basically what we do with our money. You can spend it, and we all know that we do that. We spend it on food, and we spend it on clothes, and we spend it on a house and a car. We spend all, we spend our money. You repay debt, and that, that looks a little bit different for all of us, but we all have generally have some debt and maybe it's a mortgage maybe it's car maybe it's credit card maybe it's medical bills maybe it's a student loan of some kind we repay debt we pay taxes and hopefully you do that whether you like the government or you don't like the government hopefully we all still pay our taxes you save some of it maybe it's a 401k or an IRA or maybe it's a high interest savings account of some sort we save money and then with whatever it is that's left over we give some of it and this is typically, again, the five things that we do with our money. Now, what's interesting about these five things is this, is when you assess them, there's a common trend with them. So when we spend our money, generally, we're spending it on us. So that's me. And when we, when we repay debt, well, that's me. And when we're paying taxes, while it goes to the government, we're doing it so the government doesn't come after us. And guess what? That's me. And then when we're saving, generally, well, we're saving not for somebody else for the most part, we're saving for me. And then lastly, with whatever's left over to give, we give it to God and to others. And the concern here with this approach is this, is that this is a me first living that leads to leftover giving. It's a me first living lifestyle that really doesn't prioritize contributing to God and contributing to others. Now, if God owns it all, he's not asking you to give it all. You shouldn't do that. Like, people often think you have to give everything away. That, that's silly. That's irresponsible. If you give everything away, then you become a burden to somebody else. So that's not what God wants. What does he want? Well, Jesus said this. And again, this is a very critical principle for managing your finances. It's not a directive. It's simply Jesus saying, hey, here's an observation. You believe in me? You don't believe in me? Doesn't matter. Here's the observation. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because where your treasure is, that's your interest, that's your time, that's your money. It's all going towards your treasure, and your heart follows this. And maybe, maybe you've seen this before. 
you see this, and again, maybe you've done this before, maybe you've certainly seen this. I saw it just the other day. It's whenever somebody buys the really, really nice car, and nothing wrong with buying the really, really nice car, but you know where their heart is when they park all the way out at the end of the parking lot because they are scared of what's going to happen to that car. Now, when I see that, again, I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, I know where your heart really is. Your heart is way out at the end of that parking lot with that car of yours. And maybe you put a lot of time into uh, rebuilding a car, and I get that, that's great. Or maybe you've saved up, saved for years and years, and you're finally able to buy the car of your dreams, that's great. But when that car is way, way, way out there, that's, again, I'm not even, it's all good. i just saying that's where our heart is. And we have things like this in our lives that have our heart. And God doesn't want your money. I certainly don't want your money. I want for you, and God wants for you, for him to really have your heart, to be guiding you in your life, in all that you do, in all that you say. That principle that Jesus laid out for us is like a thermometer. When he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, after you've assessed where your money is going, that becomes a thermometer for you. The thermometer doesn't change your temperature. It tells you what your temperature really is. It, sa- it shows you like how committed you are really to the Lord, how much of your heart God really has, how much of my heart God really has. When we assess where our money's really going, it tells us the temperature of our love, you might say, for him. And so coming back to where we were a minute ago with the me, 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 God and others idea we see there that this is that me first living. But Jesus has something different for us. This is what Jesus said. He said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things will be given to you as well. His kingdom and his righteousness. Now we read that and we, we get what it says. I should put God first in my life. But we don't really know how it relates to us exactly because we don't live in a kingdom. And righteousness is a little bit, spiritually speaking, confusing. Because it seems odd to say, but, but we kind of get it. But the idea again is is that Jesus should be first in our lives. And so when we live with that kind of mentality, all of a sudden this flips to that. And biblically speaking, when we get our priorities right, this is how it works out. Now what's amazing about this is we still get a whole lot of that pie, don't we? It's just this first part goes to the Lord and even to helping other people, those things that are on our heart. And what I have found for ourselves specifically, personally, is that as we have functioned with this, and we committed, as Laura and I committed, as soon as we got married, that we were always going to focus on the Lord first with our finances, and we would allow him to direct it from there. It helped us to, I would say, over, it kept us from overextending ourselves. It, it, It caused us, certainly, to buy a house much later in life than we would have otherwise, but then it really kept us from buying a house that we probably couldn't have afforded much further back. And so we end up with a great home. And God is faithful. Again, when we seek him first, all of those things get added to us. And the things that get added to us is what so many of us so desperately want. And when God gets our heart, we get him. And what are those things? Well, it's more peace. So you can sleep at night. You don't have to stay up worrying about your money. It's more joy. Because you're not always arguing with your spouse about where the money is going or about all those lattes being bought or about all the DoorDash or whatever it is. You have more purpose now. You have more meaning. And of course, you have more financial margin. Less debt, less stress, and more margin in nearly every area of your life. And that is a pretty incredible thing when we put God first. Now, I'm going to share a testimony video with you. It's about four minutes long, and it's of a family who attend our church, and and they have experienced this firsthand in their own life. They had a season where they were giving to the Lord, or, well, maybe not quite like that, but they were basically giving to God, as they'll tell you in the story. And then they had a time where they weren't. And then they realized that they lost everything that they had before, that peace, that joy, that love, and even that financial margin that God had been giving them in their lives. And then with that, they realized that they really want to spend their lives honoring God with how much he has blessed them with, how much he's blessed all of us with. Check out the story of Scott and Crystal Lowe right now. Hi, I'm Scott. 
I'm Crystal. We have been part of the Valley View family since probably 2014, 2015. We have been married uh, since 1989, and we have seven beautiful children. I grew up in a, a Christian home. My mom and my dad you know, dragged me to church every Sunday because I sort of wandered away as a teenager in my early 20s and then came back in my late 20s when Crystal and I got to. I have a similar story. We started atten attending church when I was probably fifth grade and have had a relationship with Christ ever since. Before we came back to God, we were making decisions about what our lives looked like and we were making those decisions sort of on our own, in our own power, certainly not thinking about how that would please God or how that would bring honor to God. The first time I heard that I was supposed to give 10% of uh, my money to uh, the church, I was like, no, <laughs> she's not gonna do that. It's, it's, my money and uh, how am I possibly going to pay all my bills and and you know buy the food that I need and you know we, we talked about how many kids we have it's a large family so how are we gonna you know be able to supply everything the kids need we barely make it now how are we gonna make it on even less it doesn't make any sense to us after being in the church for a while and hearing teaching on tithing and things like that it definitely resonated with us that this is something that we needed to do and even though it didn't seem like it would make sense to be able to do that we did make a commitment that we were going to start tithing. We didn't arrive like where we are today sort of overnight. It was through a series of lessons that God taught us. We had to go through a church split. We came to a point at that at that moment where we were like, I'm not giving money to that church. And and, and our wording was that church, right? We were thinking very much about the building and that group of people. And we decided we're done. We're, we're not giving money to that church anymore. God had to teach us that it wasn't about giving money to that church, it was about giving money to God, it was about giving money to Him. Now we were thinking about, well, what does this decision that we're going to make, this house that we're going to buy, or this car that we're going to buy, or how we're going to spend our money, or how we're going to save our money, you know, how does that honor God? How does that bring honor to God? How does that draw others to God? Is it an example that others can look at and say, well, that's different, that must be a God thing. It wasn't overnight that we got to where we are in our conviction about tithing and our beliefs about tithing, it was a, a journey. And um, part of that journey was saying, okay, I don't think we can do 10%. And so we started with 5%. And um, God truly is faithful in this. And so then we were like, you know what? We're kind of holding back from God. So let's, let's give that full 10%. And we made that commitment. And then over the years, you know, we went 12%, 15%. And again, uh, every time it's like this little bit of joy that rises up in my heart that I can give a little bit more and I don't have to worry that my needs are not going to be met because I know that God's faithful to me in that. And it's just, it's really, it's hard to describe, but it's really just this beautiful, beautiful thing. And so I would say if somebody's struggling with, oh gosh, do I really have to do that? I would say, no, you don't have to, you get to. You know, in Malachi 3.10, God says, test me and I will show you. I think the mention of the verse in Malachi is really important because it does invite you to see God prove his faithfulness to you in the area of tithing. He says, test me, bring your stuff into the storehouse and see if I'm not going to open up and pour out blessings upon you. And those blessings may not be financial, they may be blessings in so many other ways that you can't even begin to think about now. Think about it as, a, as an opportunity to worship, an opportunity to honor God, and an opportunity to shift your own thinking about your finances and God's role in your finances. I began to wrap that up and really put a bow on it by saying, when we dedicate our money to the Lord, like he shows himself to be faithful again and again and again and again. What I also love is the fact that, that God, he took the first step with all of this. And if we think back to Margaret Wise Brown, here was this woman who sadly died at a very young age. And then, as we would all come to find out, she gave this boy unimaginable riches that he, at the time, certainly didn't appreciate. And I would say it's hard to even imagine throughout his life if he really grasped what had been actually given to him. But he had a lot that was given to him. And because of what was given to him, it wasn't because of anything he had done. It was purely because of the generosity and the sacrifice and the care of this woman. And that's what Jesus has done with every one of us. 
but that, that there was definitely this point at which we didn't fully appreciate what was given to us. And I don't know if we ever really imagine, fully appreciate everything that Christ has given us. But this man at a very young age died. He died for someone like you and like me. And as a result of that, we get to experience riches beyond our wildest imaginations, imagination in Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And the riches and the prosperity that he's talking about here is spiritual. It's that love and that joy and that peace and that patience and that kindness that so often our financial stress take away from us. But as we come to him... In the sacrifice that he made for each and every one of us, we get to experience that love and that joy and that peace and that patience and that kindness that he has given us. And then we can go live it out in gratitude and generosity and all sorts of areas of our life, but especially in managing well what it is that we have been given. And so with this idea in mind, we're gonna go into a time of communion. And we're gonna reflect on the fact that many years ago, there was a man who gave his life for us. And as we, as he gave his life for each and every one of us, even though we might not fully appreciate it now, even though maybe we didn't fully appreciate it for much of our lives, that for this moment, we can think about the sacrifice that he made for each and every single one of us. And in that, we draw close to him. And so if you've called on the name of Jesus, we wanna invite you into this time of communion in which you can take that cracker that represents his body that was, that was torn, and the juice that represents his blood that was shed. And in this time, we can reflect and remember on the sacrifice that he made for us. If you haven't received communion, just raise your hand. Our team will be happy to get that to you right now. But in the meantime, let's have a word of prayer and we'll continue in our service. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you, that you aren't just giving us a directive, but Father, you set an example for us. And in that example, God, we come to you right now with gratitude. We're grateful for all that you've given us in Christ. Father, may our hearts be near you. And Lord, may our heart be given over to you. Father, we dedicate our finances to you. And Lord, may we be all be better managers of it from this day forward. In Jesus Christ's name.